Well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad you could come. I know we had some competition on campus with a really excellent talk about the history of the moon program, the space program. The advantage of this talk, of course, it's free. <laughs> yeah. Now, I bet you didn't know that the college and university has formed a new department. <laughs> the fringe division. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that are inherent in this TV show called Fringe. Now, hands up, who here has seen Fringe? Great. I'll talk a little bit about it for those who haven't seen it as well. Now, I'm a huge fan of Dilbert as well that many of my students know, so no talk would be complete without beginning with an appropriate Dilbert cartoon. And it's about Fringe science. Because we're here talking about Fringe the TV show, not necessarily Fringe Science. And as a little thing in the top there says, this isn't how it's done, okay? <clears throat> or is it? Hmm. Sometimes. Let's hope that this is not how science advances, right? It's how Scott Adams envisions it. So, STEM. Four fields, um, all closely related, all fields I find absolutely fascinating, and I hope by the end of tonight you'll have an increased interest in pursuing one of these fields or getting involved as an informed citizen in these topics. So STEM itself, as I mentioned, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. There's a couple of other related phrases that are kind of bounced around a bit. One is STEAM where the R refers to arts. There's one called STEM plus M. I didn't create these, by the way. STEM plus M. And there, the M stands for music. So last spring, the Brevard Symphony Orchestra had an amazing concert held at KSC. And the orchestra was set up right underneath the orbiter. And they played, so you're looking at the orbiter and all the space memorabilia are playing below with the appropriate space-themed songs. And it was about at this time that I was starting to think about STEM and STEM outreach and so on. And as this shows, I write a newspaper column for Florida Today. That's why I'm giving them their due. And that was the first time I kind of published work uh, where I was trying to raise awareness of the interplay between STEM activities and other fields that people don't always think about, like the arts. Not everyone in science and engineering is a total geek, unlike me. Some of them actually like the arts and stuff. And there's long been known to be a relationship, for example, between some of the science activities and an aptitude and interest in music. So that's STEM plus M. But the main reason I got kind of interested in it was that I view STEM outreach as part of the mission of the university, and it's certainly part of the mission of my new position. As Daniel mentioned, I'm not a director of, of computing education within the Education and Interdisciplinary Studies Department. And as part of this work on STEM outreach, I've been trying to think about these two important questions. These are not new questions. Many, many people have looked at them for a long time. We'll continue to look at them because they're so important to our society. The first is how to get young people more interested in STEM careers. There are so many negative stereotypes related to science and engineering as a field that I think part of our job is to remove those stereotypes. They're portrayed in the media and movies all the time. And the second, and it affects everyone else who's not in school, and that is, how can we get society engaged in STEM-related discussions? So that when it comes to setting, for example, government policy, the decisions that are made are informed on concrete evidence. And everyone here could be like a citizen journalist, right? You need to be an informed citizen. And to be an informed citizen, you should be aware of what's happening right now in some of the newest developments in these fields. Now, I'm going to talk not tonight, about the second issue specifically. Save that for another night. But for the first one, I was trying to think about what do young people 
and I'll put myself in that category even though I'm not young. I'm young at heart, as the saying goes. Um, what gets them excited? And ever since I moved to Florida, what gets me excited are rockets. We live on the Space Coast, after all, right? I was amazed when I first moved here, and I saw the hotels down by the beach, and they had three things written on the board. And it was the temperature of the air, the temperature of the water, and the time of the next launch. And where else can you get that, right? This past summer, I was in London. And I got to speak to um, an officer in the Royal Air Force, an active officer, a wing commander. And he's not just a guy who flies around in very fast aircraft. He's also the only human being that's driven a car faster than the speed of sound. In 1997, he was in a car um, called the Bloodhound. And it broke the speed of sound by only a couple of miles per hour, but they broke it. And jump forward now 14 or so years, and there's a new project. And it's called, um, it's called, it's called written right here. His name is escaping me. It's called the Bloodhound SSC. Now, this is a very large international effort. And they're using the vehicle, if you pardon the pun, as a means of introducing students all over the world to STEM. Because as you can imagine, to make a car go faster than the speed of sound is quite a feat. There's all kinds of new engineering and, and science that needs to be used to develop a new technology. The goal of this car in about three years from now is to go 1,000 miles an hour. To do so, they're clearing a huge track in South Africa. It turns out the tracks that they were using out in Salt Lake are not big enough for this car. And the granularity of that they're polishing this ground to is absolutely amazing. Because as Andy Green, the pilot slash driver, explained to me, the wheels in this car are going supersonic. In fact, they're creating little shockwaves so that when the wheels actually hit the ground a few milliseconds, the ground has already crumbled. It's gone. So it's almost driving over something that's not there anymore. Now, he has, of course, a very strong vested interest in making sure that this car goes properly. And he did say as a joke, he's the only guy who's driven a car faster than sound, but he's never heard it. <laughs> because, of course, it's behind him at that point, right? Right, so this car has a Typhoon fighter jet engine in it. And he sits right in front of it in this little cockpit. But when that's just not fast enough, they turn on the rocket. And that's what's going to get them to 1,000 miles per hour. Now, the obvious question people ask them is, why are you doing this? And it's like climbing the mountain, you know? Well, because it's there, because we want to. But it's also because what a better way to get people interested in an absolutely fascinating, just cool development. As I said, here we're used to seeing rockets go up. Imagine seeing this going up 95. <laughs> that would be cool. All right, let's turn our, our attention to fringe. You know they say professors aren't fashion conscious? I mean, I wore the shirt to match the, the fringe poster. <laughs> All right. I don't know where the frogs are, but the rest of the color matches. Fringe was a TV show that ran on Fox Network for about five years. I have to say, I never saw it when it was on. Like many people these days, I binge watched it last year on Netflix. Um, ran for five seasons, 100 episodes. You notice, are you familiar with the first gentleman's name who created this? What else has he done? J.J. Abrams. Rebooted Star Trek. I, b I believe he's currently busy doing the new Star Wars movie. Yes, so he's a busy fellow, very talented guy, and he put a lot of effort with many other people into creating this TV show. It was a procedural drama, involved three main characters, Olivia Dunham, an FBI agent, Peter Bishop, I called him an MIT rogue. He went to MIT and then he went rogue. He was off working in Iraq and you know, doing shady deals and stuff. And Walter Bishop, a Harvard sort of ex-professor, 
And he was an ex-professor because he was put in a loony bin for like 15 years. As the series progresses, you find out why he was there. But he's brought back as they create the Fringe Division. Um, the Fringe Division, as an aside, is based in the FBI's Boston office. That's important when we talk about robots a bit later on. If you haven't seen Fringe, you might be familiar with the X-Files. So think of it as an updated version of the X-Files with a little bit of Twilight Zone and Altered States in old movie all kind of commingled. Every season of Fringe included these kind of glyphs. And it turns out this is actually a language. At the end of every season, if you track the, the different animals and where these dots were, it gave you a message. And yes, people did that. <laughs> now, yes, the Fringe folks. Now, for every season of Fringe, they had an opening title sequence. You're going to see one near the end of this presentation. And it had music, but it had all these words going across the screen. The words were meant to represent topics, some of which we're going to talk about tonight, that were not yet possible, but they hope soon would be. So leading edge research. Okay? So some of these words we are somewhat familiar with. Artificial intelligence. Reanimation. That's basically Frankenstein, right? Some other words, not quite so sure actually what they mean. Proto-science, it's kind of like fringe science. If you go farther up, I didn't show season five and a couple of other variations. The, the topics that these words represent get increasingly esoteric, like quantum entanglement near the top. I put all the words that are used in each of the seven variations of fringe through a program that generates a word cloud. A word cloud is just a representation of the number of words that appear and their um, quantity of appearance in each year. And the words that appear larger or in darker font are the ones that appear more commonly across the years. So from this we can see some of the top themes that appear across the different fringe seasons. Quantum is one, nanotechnology, invisibility, artificial, pandemic. I mean, we're the world's suffering through almost pandemic now over in Africa, right? So some of these things, as I said, are way out there. Some of these are almost now. Some of them are now. So I thought it would be interesting to use this TV show as a hook. Now, those of you who've been to my presentations before know you've got to do some work. It's not just me talking. So it's like a good classroom. Please take one and pass it around. I have an exercise for you. You can think about it as you get your little index card to write your answer. One of the topics that's mentioned there is something that we can talk about very briefly, whether or not it's real or not. There's actually three questions I want you to think about. Is the question I'm going to ask you, is the topic real? If it's not real, what would be the advances in the STEM fields needed to make it real? And if it was real, what would be the impact on society? How would we be impacted, influenced? And the question I'm going to ask you to explain is this. Invisibility. So while you're thinking about your answer, maybe I should just do a show of hands. Is invisibility real? Hands up if you think yes. What a bunch of geeks, I'm telling you. When I, when I say invisibility, what do you think of? What, Ironically, what image is popping into your mind for invisibility? Camouflage. Camouflage. Stealth. So most of the time we think about invisibility, we think about something we can see, right? And how do we see? We see by, by light being reflected off whatever I'm looking at, going back to my eyeballs into my brain. It recognizes patterns, colors, and so on. But there, of course, there are other forms of invisibility. You can have audible. Think of a submarine. You know the old saying, run silent, run deep? 
I would use sonar to try and detect submarines. So they spent a lot of time trying to make submarines basically invisible to audio. Someone mentioned stealth. What is the mechanism we've been using since World War II to track things in the air? Radar. Radar. It's kind of like mechanical version of your eyes, but they're much better at 2020 to the far. So it's a great way of tracking things, unless you don't want to be tracked. In which case, we want to be invisible, and that's camouflage. Now, we've had camouflage for clothing. Like, that's why the folks in the military wear all those jungle-like attire, so that you don't see them. Same reason why you paint the under, underside of aircraft different colors so when they're flying overhead, they're kind of invisible to the clouds or the sky, depending on where they're flying. Now, for the youngsters in the audience, what do you think of when, you say, when I say invisibility? Yes. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> yes, Harry Potter wears an invisibility cloak. It's something I wrote about a little over three years ago. Now, is Harry Potter's invisibility cloak real or just something in the author's mind? Well, you can actually buy it on Amazon, but I don't think it's functional. <laughs> Maybe someday, but not quite. But it doesn't mean people aren't trying. So the way we can create invisibility is to basically address how we see. We're talking about visible invisibility right now. And as this article um, talks about, there's a lot of work underway right now in special materials that reflects, reflects the light, so it bends around the object. Think about the James Bond movie, Die Another Day. Remember the car he had? Had all these interesting mirrors and lights that when you looked at it and John Cleese's character Q clicked the button and the car disappeared. Now that was a James Bond movie, of course. But can you imagine people developing that now? Absolutely. Invisibility is just the next step in stealth. So, I hope you had some interesting examples of what invisibility was when you're writing your little example. So when you go home at night to say, what did they talk about? Something about invisibility. I don't know. Let me show you a video. Fringe involves many things and includes time travel. In one of the episodes in season two, the main characters go back in time. And because they're back in time, that opening sequence is set in 1985. So what you're gonna see here, cross your fingers that the video works, is words, those images, going by. And remember, these words are meant to represent something that is just on the cutting edge or might become true circa 1985. You see personal computing there? IVF, stealth, virtual reality. You notice the computer font? Very 1980s, huh? So every season and sometimes in, within one season, the words that appeared there were a little bit different. But I want you to think about some of those words because remember it was meant to be something quite far off. Now, did we have personal computers in 1985? Of course. Um, they weren't quite as common as now. They certainly weren't as powerful. We had IVF. We didn't have quite the stealth technology we had now, and we didn't have invisibility yet. So I want to talk to you about four specific topics related to uh, STEM and fringe. Like all professors, by the way, I could talk all night. <laughs> so for all of these topics, I could just talk all night just on one of them. But I know many people want to get up to see the telescope, and I'm standing in your way. So we're going to go a little bit fast. <laughs> Robots, artificial evolution, teleportation, and man-machine interfaces. For each one of these, I want you to think about the three <clears throat> questions again. Is it real? What is the STEM involved to make it real, if it's not real now, or to improve it? And how would these developments affect society? Because all of them can and will profoundly affect everyone's life. Even if you think it's not going to affect you, believe me, it will, and some of them already are. 
Now I have to say, many of the advertisements that were made for this talk um, said we were going to be talking about time travel. Um, I've already covered it, you just don't remember it yet. Okay? All right. Robots. Now I'm a bit like a shrink. I say robots, you think what? What do you think of when I say robots? R2-D2, did I say you were a bunch of geeks or what? R2-D2, Doctor Who, Robbie the, Robbie the Robot, I heard Isaac Asimov, Rosie, oh, I have a picture of Rosie coming up. There's an old Jetsons fan back there. So, are robots real? Question one. But the ones we just mentioned are more fictional. What's a real robot? Someone say here saying Roomba. I'm going to show you that too. But all right. So robots are they real? Yes. I had someone ask me the question. Depends what you mean by real. I thought it was a Bill Clinton. Depends what is is. You know, it's a, I meant real. Like they're here. We can use them. This is what I think of when I think of robots. You know, the Terminator. Yeah, it's creepy, all right. Can the Terminator affect society? Well, yes, if we follow our current path, yes. Especially with the time travel. Why does a robot have teeth? Um, why not? Because <laughs> it's meant to be a humanoid robot. Remember, he's supposed to have an exoskeleton of flesh. Um, but he's been burned off in this, episode, in this part. Yeah. All right. So we're going to now talk about robots in Fringe, as examples of things that aren't quite true yet, and then robots in the real world. So in Fringe, they have a unique kind of robot. You might call it a wetware robot. You notice his head is not quite attached to his body here. Anyone know where that saying is coming from? It's paraphrasing another saying. Blade Runner. Philip Dick's movie, Do Robots Dream of Electric Sheep? Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Here, the robots in Fringe are called shapeshifters. And they are artificial constructs created by, I guess too complicated, they're created by someone else. And they're sent to help these other aliens called observers, which we'll talk about in a moment. The only way the people in the Fringe division can find out if these guys are robots or not is when they bleed, because they bleed mercury, which generally is toxic to us, right? Mercury in your blood, not good. For them, it's part of their blood. Um, so these are shapeshifters. When they actually arrive, they're formless. And they stick this nasty device in the roof of the mouth of the person they want to mimic, and all of a sudden they become that form. So they're like a golem. Now, can we do that now? Thankfully not. They can do it in Fringe, though. But how about the real world? Now, someone mentioned Rosie. This is from the Jetsons, you know, the old cartoon. And the thinking was we would have a robotic maid. I have a robot at home. That's it. I call that robot I, Rosie. <laughs> and I'm not sure if it's I, comma, Rosie, like I, robot, or little I, like apples, I, Rosie. But it's a robot that cleans my house. It kind of runs around. It's actually a little bit freakish to watch, uh, the way it learns patterns. Um, if you go on YouTube, you can see all kinds of interesting videos of your cat riding around on them and stuff. <laughs> so it's an interesting event that one of the first common uses of robots in the world, outside of manufacturing special purpose, is to clean your house. But that's a good use of what the word robot means, right? Which refers to the fact that you can have a machine carry out the task of a human. Now, here's another vision of robots. Transformers. That's right. Now, are transformers real? Well, let's just see. 
Um, I don't think they've appeared anywhere yet except when they filmed the previous movie up near the Cape, but um, this was actually from the latest movie. Now, Transformers, if you don't know or if you haven't seen the movies, these things change shape, right? They become cars to these giant robots, and they switch shape on the fly. And they're also sentient. That is, they have their own personality, their own intelligence. And there's good robots and bad robots, right? All right, let's see if this one works. Now, most of you said we can't do that kind of automatic transformation that a transformer can. Anyone here know how to do origami? You can make really complicated little things for a paper. That requires us to think about the materials involved, the manufacture of this composite structure, and a lot that has to do with the design. And so one way to do this it's to make a flat composite. You have flexible print circuit boards. You can make them out of paper and polystyrene. polystyrene is Not exactly expensive. They're making robots out of paper. You come out with a fold pattern. And you take your composite and fold it up into a functioning machine. And what we do is we mechanically pre-program this composite with features at each hinge, which tell it how far to fold along each line. It's doing this by itself. It assembles itself and walks away. It's made of paper. Did I mention that? Paper. Is to have a complex robot do something useful, yet have it not be something like that. What makes the paper move? The surface and the things that are etched on it. They react to certain the erect electricity that are being provided by the few little motors and controls there. Okay, let's skip that for a moment. So this is, a, to me, a very fascinating development. We think of robots, first of all, as being very expensive, right? Very sophisticated. And we certainly don't see them assembling themselves. You know some companies that are interested in self-assembly? Can you imagine? Ikea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd be interested in it, too. You bring it home, you open the box, brrr, it builds itself, <laughs> right? But this is extremely low-cost manufacturing of self-assembly of robots, and it's only one. They can work in swarms. So you can imagine them. They're basically throwaway robots. Now, they can't do much yet because this is very bleeding-edge stuff. But you can see the promise. Now, let me show you some other fascinating uh, robot videos. This front comes from a company called Boston Dynamics. Now, I mentioned Fringe Division is headquartered in Boston. In the Fringe TV show, the main large industry DOD contractor is called Massive Dynamics. No coincidence. These are robots that are mimic human and animal form. Boston Dynamics is now owned by Google, wow. as an aside. So let's take a look at this. This stuff is really fascinating. I'm always looking for snakes or spiders. Now I have to look for the robots in the forest here. Watch how this robot walks. Oh, 
that's not a person in there, that's the robot with a suit on. And this is their mechanical cheetah. Watch the clock down there, it's gonna run faster <coughs> than the same bolt. Excuse me. The um, what they call the bipedal humanoid, you know, sort of the human man-shaped robot. You know, the headless—they're all headless, you notice, which is really spooky. They have other videos you can see of it walking on rocks to simulate, you know, rough terrain. They hit it with weights, like big, you know, medicine balls and stuff to knock it off, and it—it's standing there on one leg while they're hitting it with these balls, and it just gets back, goes back up together. Now, are these real? Used? Yes. You can see another video of that one that looked like the headless mule that's been used already in field trials by the Marines out in California and Hawaii to carry 100 pound supplies. And they're going through the Hawaiian, uh, you know, the jungles of Hawaii and up and down very rough terrain. The assumption is that these can be used in the future for supplies um, going into contaminated areas, that sort of thing. So there's lots of benign beneficial uses for these kind of robots. But of course, like all technology, there's other uses. Now, on the left is a drone. It's, this one's called the Reaper. And as his name suggests, it's meant to be a lethal weapon. And it's real, of course. Now, the drone is not technically a robot because it is controlled by a pilot remotely. You know, this might be flying over Afghanistan and the pilot is in Utah or something. That's literally how it works. However, you can imagine that at some point there's a desire among certain people to remove the human element. And what you end up with is the image over there, which is from Robocop. And those are autonomous shoot to kill. Now, when I mentioned the impact on society, would you be comfortable with having a Melbourne police robot going around with the ability to shoot to kill without any human intervention? <laughs> so the gentleman said it depends on how good the AI or the software is. Well, having been in software engineering forever, I wouldn't trust it. Not yet. <laughs> I trust them more than these things. Now, there are some other uses that I didn't show here. People have probably heard about Amazon's somewhat marketing, somewhat real I uh, idea to start doing package delivery via drones. Mm -hmm. And you see, they actually have demos of them flying around, dropping the package and flying away. And that's just cool, right? <laughs> Never mind next day, two day delivery. It's like 30 minutes. It's like a pizza. It's right there. You don't pay. Second topic. Artificial evolution. Now, the adjective artificial here implies it's different than normal evolution, right? And normal evolution takes a long time, eons, millennia, long time for something to change, adapt to its environment. Artificial evolution implies that something is changing very, very rapidly. So again, same questions. Do you think artificial evolution is real? Um, wow, everyone says yes. What do you think of when I say when, I, when you say yes? What are you thinking of? Monsanto. Genetically modified foods, Monsanto. Okay. Dog breeds. Pardon? Dog breeds. Dog breeds. Yeah. Okay. So the gentleman said 8,000 years of genetic manipulation to change breeds of flowers, dogs, so on. I'm talking about things that are going to take minutes, weeks, hours, like that. A completely different time scale to the evolution that we're familiar with. And when I think of artificial evolution, I think of two things. This. This is the HAL 9000 from the... 2001 movie. 
Now, how did it work out for Spaceman Dave when Hal took over? <laughs> Not so good. That is Scarlett Johansson from the movie that came out this summer, Lucy. So this represents machine-based artificial evolution. Might be a sentient robot, for example. The other represents biological evolution, enhanced biological evolution. In the movie Lucy, her character at the beginning of the movie is just a regular young lady. And she gets kind of um, tricked into carrying drugs. But drugs turn out to be a hormone. And instead of having a very small amount of them, she's got packages of them sewn into her belly. And then she gets kicked and the packages burst open. And what happens is the whole movie is based on the concept that you've probably heard that we only use 10% of our brain. Now, whether or not that's true or false, let's take it as baseline, okay? Let's take it that we have a lot of room for improvement. In this movie, her abilities, her cognitive abilities start going up. 20%, 40, 60, 80, eventually 100. And of course, her abilities change. Not just her ability to think fast, it's ability to do all kinds of other really cool things. But it's a movie, of course. Not all of it is real or likely to be real. However, are we working on artificial evolution of either of these forms now? Absolutely. Let's see what they do in Fringe, first of all. In Fringe, there's two forms of artificial evolution. Both of them happen to be biological. The first is what the main character, remember that Harvard ex professor? One of the reasons why he kind of got put in the loony bin and kicked out of the program and so on was that he was running human experiments, injecting a bunch of kids with this drug. It's not a real drug. But in the movie, it's called Cortexafan. In the TV show called Cortexafan. And what it does, if you can read it, to prevent the natural shrinking of brain power, resulting in an increase in mental ability. It basically increases the children in the study, their brain capability, and opens up all kinds of interesting powers, you know, telekinesis and other outlandish things very much like Lucy. And the goal was to enhance these people, right? Didn't work out so well. However, it did have an effect. The other part of artificial evolution in Fringe is evolving the human race. Now, this is a scene from later on. This particular, I won't say gentleman, this humanoid is called an observer. Observers, as her name suggests, are among, among us. They're like pod people. And they're just watching and reporting back to their overlords who are actually from our future. In the future, this is around 600 years in our future, um, they are created and grown in a tube. And they're all male, interestingly. So they're all gun, um, created from a single or multiple strands of male DNA. Believe me, it doesn't work out well for them either, ultimately. When they actually appear in the TV show, they look like that. They look like they watched, watched off the Mad Men set. <laughs> the ones who live on the edge wear gray. The rest all wear black. See? Um, but they're all bald, skinless, uh, hairless. They have no eyebrows. And... Um, they have unique abilities. They can travel through space and through time. However, they are the result of artificial evolution that in the fringe time um, space happens about 60 years from now, 50 years from now. Remember, this is fictional, or is it? Where scientists figure out a way to improve our brain power. Unfortunately, they have to remove something else to improve your brain power. So what they start removing are emotions, the ability to think creatively. And they keep doing that. In 600 years after doing all this process, they destroyed the Earth. And they kind of look like that. Emotionless. Um, remember the steam, the arts? Definitely no arts involved. Now that's all fringe. Let's go back to the real world for a, mo for a moment, or sort of real world. This, of course, is IBM's Watson computer. Three years ago, you may remember, Watson won Jeopardy. 
Remember, it beat the leader of Jeopardy. Now, Watson has not been idle for the last three years. They've been feeding Watson, they being IBM folks, have been feeding Watson as much information as they possibly can. And it learns, I'll say learns in quotes. The intended uses of Watson are things like healthcare, so that you know when you have a medical problem, sometimes the diagnosis is very challenging. You might have more than one issue. Watson is able to look at across a huge database of medical sources and provide a more pinpointed diagnosis for you. They also want to use it in law and other fields. Now, is Watson self-aware? No. One of the many futurists around Rick Kurzweil talked about the, what will happen when computers like this become very, very intelligent or more powerful than we are. It's called a singularity. At that point, it's like back to Terminator. You know when Skynet becomes self-aware and decides we're not worth it and we're gone? At this point, if the computer itself becomes self-aware, what's one thing right now that computers can't really do but the, and the observers were able to do in a very bizarre way? And that is procreate. Now, who makes computers now? We do. We design the software, we build the hardware. In this model, imagine the computer starts building better versions of itself. We've already seen the robotics that can carry out the manufacturing for it. And then the next version of the computer is much better. But that cycle is not decades. That's very, very fast and it speeds up so fast that all of a sudden that computer is so much more powerful than we are, we barely understand how it works. Could this happen? Yes, in my opinion. It's not happening tomorrow. But we, in fact, are spending an awful lot of research dollars to make that happen. That's the societal implication, indeed. If you attach Watson to a car building in Detroit, mm -hmm. you're saying they could, Watson could by itself build a better car. I'm, I'm saying Watson ultimately could design a better Watson. How big is Watson? Yeah. Oh, it's the size of several refrigerators right now. But all supercomputers start like that and they end up being like my MacBook over there. So remember one of the things on Fringe was nanotechnology, miniaturization. It's one of the most powerful developments in the last few decades, everything getting smaller and smaller. I didn't have a chance to show you about robots that are the size of pennies. They're also throwaway and they swarm all over the place. It's amazing. Now. The, fl the other type of evolution, biological, well, that's from Rise of the Planet of the Apes, the reboot of the Apes franchise. Which one of those two individuals is evolving faster? His name is Caesar, yes. Caesar is evolving faster than the person who gave him the drug. Now, one of the current topics in medical research is gene therapy the ability to make drugs that are targeted to your genetic makeup. So imagine everyone probably knows someone, unfortunately, who's had cancer. And you have to go through chemotherapy. It's very, very disruptive because it destroys good tissue while it's trying to destroy the bad. Imagine if you had drugs that are targeted just to you. Or, you know, someone who has dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease. In this movie, the gentleman on the right, a scientist, is developing a drug to help Parkinson's patients. In fact, he gives it to his father who has Parkinson's and he gets better. But then unfortunately he regresses. And he decides to give it to the apes. And that's how they evolve very, very quickly. Now, do we have gene therapy and artificial evolution or synthetic drugs now? Like what? Yes. Right. So these are, these are things that are very, very promising, very complicated. Now I have something from personal experience. If I was standing talking to you 40 years ago, I have an insulin pump on because I'm a type 1 diabetic. 40 years ago, I'd be like living on the island of Dr. Moreau because the insulin on me would be coming from a pig or a cow. The insulin I'm using now is synthetic. It's recombinant DNA grown from humans. Without it, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So there definitely are lots of beneficial developments. And there are a lot of 
possibly scary ones. Third topic, teleportation. What do you think of when I say teleportation? Star Trek? Star Trek? Doctor Who again? With the TARDIS? That's the thing that trials for time. Well, is it real? If you think it's real, how is it real today? Okay. Willy Wonka. And the great glass elevator. Ah, right. I forgot about that one. Good, good one. When I hear, when I see teleportation, like many people said, I think of this. I think of Captain Kirk being, you know, beam me up, Scotty, and he gets, you know, sent down to the planet surface or vice versa, depending which way he's going. Yes, sir. How, how do you think John Carter got to Mars back in 1912? <laughs> <laughs> that movie didn't do very well, so I don't know how he did. <laughs> Right. In the Fringe, on the Fringe TV show, they don't quite do teleportation the way the, you know, the transporter does. What you see here is a scene from the show where they're mixing old and new. So they're at a typewriter. This is an electric one. And there's a mirror. And they type a message here. And in this parallel universe, the answers get typed. So they're communicating through these different universes basically teleporting information, as some people mentioned, which I'll talk about in a moment. They don't actually transport um, the people. They also have the ability to kind of like view it as it was a TV show. They can see through this screen and see what's happening in this parallel world. So they're able to teleport information and images, but they cannot transport people in this mechanism. Okay, well, I'll come back to Star Trek in a moment. Right. There, there is problem. I'll just answer it now then. So if you follow the physics of how Star Trek, their transporter works, every time they step in the transporter, they're committing suicide. And every time they rematerialize, they're reborn. Does anyone have any ethical problems with that? Yes, yes. He never wants to go in the transporter. Indeed. They do, however, have this mechanism. They call it the doomsday device. Well, it's just a great literary mechanism. And you can't see it, of course, but this is the character Peter, you know, the MIT rogue. And for no reason other than dramatic effect, he's connected to this machine through his hands hanging like this, okay? And through this mechanism, he creates a bridge between these two worlds. And therefore, people can go back and forth. But bridges and so on are a little bit different than teleportation, right? That's kind of like going through a gate. Teleportation is sending something, just walking through. Now, to the real world. Think of teleportation today as kind of like time travel, which is we're not quite there yet. <laughs> However, we do have two developments that, given enough time, might make some form of teleportation possible. The first is what a few people mentioned, and that is using quantum entanglement, sending information about subatomic particles. So again, kind of like the people typing, we're just sending information, very, very limited information right now, and it does follow that destruction and recreation process, um, but it, we are able to send very limited bits of information, and this has been proven repeatedly in experiments already. Frankly, if you were at my talk last November, I said, People said, how does this work? And I just said, it just is. It just, it's just magic. It's not quite magic, but it's fascinating. So for this talk, just take it as a given that we can transport information. But information is not enough. We also need the ability to re recreate Captain Kirk, right? All right, so how do we recreate something at a distance? Well, don't transport the person. As someone said, you transport the information. And let's use a cooking analogy. We're going to send the recipe on how to rebuild a person, an object, an apple, whatever it might be, from point A to point B. Remember, we can send it at what's called the speed of light. 
and then at the other end we're going to rebuild it. Now, do we have the ability to rebuild things like this now? 3D printers. So let's watch this interesting video. Notice it says, download this thing. So that's a 3D printer. So you notice it's not really printing. It's more like a very slow inkjet printer. And this version of the printer lays down what is basically melted wax. It's not quite, uh, melted plastic, pardon me. And it puts it down in layers. And the layers change shape and color and texture as it builds. There are models that go a bit faster than this. There we are, he's printed a flower vase. All right. It's kind of interesting you can build solid objects like that. Um, I first saw a 3D printer in 2001. Not the movie, the year. Um, when I was in California, a colleague came to my office and he had a little figurine in his hand. And it looked like it was made of sandstone. And he said, Scott, look at this. I'm looking at it going, okay, it's like a little G.I. Joe or something. And he said, what do you think? And I said, nice. He said, I just printed it. I said, what do you mean just printed it? Printing is on paper. Why don't you print this? He said, oh, we have a new 3D printer. Well. 3D and printing for me didn't really make sense. It's kind of a misnomer. It's more like a small manufacturing facility. And in the last couple of years, 3D printing has gone mainstream. It is revolutionizing manufacturing. So go back to the robots and the artificial evolution and putting things together. What you've seen in these, in these printers, however, are printing plastics and polymers and stuff. However, we now already in experiments have the ability to print living tissue. The army is interested in using it to print um, ready-to-eat meals for soldiers. To print their clothes. To send parts to the space station is very expensive, right? Why send the parts? We just send the, mass, you know, the raw material, it's stored up there, and we send the recipe, and it gets printed. Repair parts in the field. This is not science fiction. And you know it's real, and you can buy it on Amazon. <laughs> you can buy them down nearly $300 now, however. You can get them for your kids. I think it's called MakerBot. <laughs> it's delivered by Amazon Drone as well, that's right. Yeah. All right. I know we're running a bit short of time, so the very last topic, the one I think is going to have the most far-reaching consequences for us, what are called man-machine interfaces. Same questions. When I say man-machine interface, what do you think of? Cyborgs? Okay, so controlling objects using your brain. Artificial limbs, exactly. So that's a big um, um, part of very beneficial application of this. Prosthetics that are, that are controlled biologically, right? Um, and that's not science fiction, that's science fact. I have to say, when I think of man-machine interfaces, I kind of think of this. 
So on the left, yes, these are images from Star Trek of the Borg. I have to say it doesn't look very pleasant to wear those interfaces. And this is Neo from the Matrix when he's just come out of his pod. You notice a giant cable going on the back of his head? Now, I don't know about you, but it's, I don't mind sitting down to the computer typing anymore knowing that the alternative is a giant spike in the back of your head. But these pods are also examples of immersive, immersive man-machine interfaces because in this case, the machines are using bodies to generate power. Not very beneficial for them. Good for the machines. Now, in Fringe, they have mechanical and biological interfaces. And on the left, that is indeed a headless body. Uh, bodiless head, pardon me, it's the other ones. The other part is left. There's a very funny say, uh, statement that, that Walter Bishop, the, the professor, mentions when there's a crime scene. And he asks his son, who's on the scene, he said, the guy's dead. He says, does he have his head? He said, only you would ask that, Walter. Yes, he has his head. Why? And he said, but he's dead. He goes, well, that might be a, just a minor inconvenience. As long as he has his head. Uh, they're going to try and extract information. In this case, this is a version of Fringe set in the future where they can reanimate the head, talk to the person, or kind of talk. No lungs, difficult to talk and stuff, but get the information out. I did mention that Fringe is also like Altered States. Yeah, anyone ever see that movie many years ago where the guy goes into this sensory deprivation tank? They use it a lot. This is Olivia, the character Olivia floating in this tank and they use it to recreate lost memories and so on. So this is kind of a biological interface. This is a mechanical, very Borg-like interface. Now back in the real world, you have to think about the main kinds of interfaces we have. One for input and one for output. What's the most common input interface we use today? And the output? Yeah. It hasn't changed that much since then, since this. Input and output. The QWERTY keyboard and the 1950s or so TV. Maybe early 60s, it's a leading edge model. Now as an aside, don't you find it interesting that we still use the QWERTY keyboard, which after all was designed to slow us down? Because these mechanical keys kept bashing one another if you could type too fast. So the keys are laid out to make it difficult for you to type. And what's my computer got here all these years later? Same layout. Now, we've got to be able to do better than that. There's a couple that are already in use now, right? One's on my phone. Siri. So you speak to your phone or your other device. It's always nice to know someone can help. It's, it's always frustrating to know what kind of help Siri comes up with. <laughs> but it's promising, right? Now, anyone know who this gentleman is? <laughs> he, he, careful, he said glass hole. Not the other word, glass hole. Yes, this is Sergey Brin, one of the founders of Google. And he's wearing Google Glass. You notice he's got a tiny little screen there. So that is what's called augmented reality. So as he's looking around, he has something being displayed. So if he looks at you, he also knows who you are. I can see your Facebook feeds. I see when your birthday is. I see where you've been today. And when I'm talking to you, you have no idea that I'm gathering all this information. The glasses are connected to the internet wirelessly. From a societal implication point of view, it's also got a camera that can send live video feeds out. So while I'm talking to you, I'm also taking your picture. You don't know it. Well, the person doesn't know. But... Um, okay, so we'll come to that in a moment. I mentioned that I was in London over the summer. In July, the UK theater board, division, whatever, whoever's in charge of all the theaters, banned Google Glass from all theaters in England because they're afraid that people are going to use them to do copyright infringement, copying of stuff. There's many places now, for example, in San Francisco that have banned glass in bars. I think the thinking is, if you're in a bar, you probably don't want to know what, you know, others, what you're doing in there. Now, a gentleman said, well, you, you can see them. So these are glass, remember, first generation. 
So shortly after Glass came out, uh, I, first people I read about was a couple of Korean researchers that embedded most of the capabilities of Glass in contact lenses. What's next? It'll be like Neo. It'll be a Google implant. You wouldn't even see it, right? Now, that's called augmented reality. This is virtual reality. This is why science has a bad name, as far as I'm concerned. Look at the look on that person's face. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't know that her mouth is hanging open and stuff because she's wearing what is called the Oculus Rift, a immersive virtual reality. It's kind of like a big TV screen inside. Currently, or just recently bought by Facebook for north of a billion dollars. Because why spend your time texting people and so on when you can in this virtual um, There's lots of virtual reality environments available now. One is called Second Life. It might may not surprise you to know that people offer courses within Second Life, where the, the professor and the students are all avatars. They're all virtual. It takes online learning to a whole new level, right? Totally virtual. Now, that is taking the person into a virtual environment. What I think is far more interesting, and we're getting close to the end, is taking the virtual environment and moving it into our world. So there's a start, there, this is, a couple of companies are trying to do this. This is a video from a company in San Francisco called Deco. And I'll show you this video. And we still interact like that. Which allowed us to carry experiences with us around in our pockets. And I believe we're now on the verge of an even larger third wave where our apps seamlessly become part of the environment around us. This will totally change how we interact with the world and ultimately with each other. So what exactly is a real world operating system? Before he goes on, you saw kind of glass. So the programs that these guys are developing can run on a phone or, an, or like an iPad or ultimately as part of glass. And what you're going to see is like this little character here. This is a digital character, right? If, you're, if you play World of Warcraft or something, you've got all these um, digital characters. Maybe you like um, Super Mario and you like to have a little guy on a go-kart going by you. In this model, you don't go into Super Mario's world. He comes into ours. So I'm walking down the street and I look down and I see Super Mario there, maybe his cousin. And if I kick him, it moves. As it goes down, if it bumps into something, it moves. He moves his cart. And they can communicate as well. Now, if you think people seem funny talking on, on Bluetooth, <laughs> can you imagine people walking down and you know, they're talking to their imaginary friends? You're like, yeah, just nuts. No, actually, he is talking to his imaginary friends. <laughs> yes. So this is his desktop, right? With these images superimposed on it, and that's what he sees. So it also uses augmented reality as well. We'll, we'll stop for that. So you see the main thing is we're taking these characters and moving into the real world. And all they have to do is that everything you see gets digitally mapped and these things get put on top of it. Yes, sir? Could you, are they doing anything to hook that into some kind of central server so that you can 
leave messages for people when they reach specific points, for instance? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, the last example of man-machine interface is definitely the one that's farthest out there. But it's the one several people like yourself mentioned. What is the ultimate man-machine interface? No interface. It would follow the Apple design model. There is no interface. It's, it just is, right? You just use it. In this case, it's an interface that literally reads your brain waves. Now, is that real? Yes. Here's a demo of it. So that is not the only company that is experimenting, of course, with neural interfaces, they're called. The ability to read and help you control your thoughts. Um, now, you can imagine the beneficial use of that, for example, people who are, say, quadriplegics and so on, or who have ALS and, and, and these other degenerative motor disorders. The ability to do more than they can do now using these kind of interfaces with the computing power behind it would be life-changing. Um, the flip side is, would you mind everyone reading your mind? Yeah. I certainly would. It would probably destroy society. And since this machine can read it, someone else can too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, two slides to wrap up. It's reading, every time you're thinking, you're giving out different sort of, um, like waves, we'll just call them waves that the machine learns the pattern. As you think of colors or shapes, your brain sends out different kind of patterns themselves. You move your arm if you have an artificial yes. arm. Yes, that's right. That's why this would be connected to prosthetics in the future as well. So to just to wrap up, I think studying STEM can be very challenging because there's an awful lot of information you need to master. But it sure is fun, right? The things you can do with the technology today and what is coming, um, is just mind-blowing. And I cannot think of an area that would be more worthwhile of everyone's efforts than to be engaged in this. And the second thing is, to help shape the future, you, everyone, you must be involved. You have to have a voice. And it, has to have, it should be an informed opinion about what's real, what's not, what is likely to come in our lifetime. And the last point, of course, is that means to become informed Education is the, the key to managing the developments in STEM. Um, all of the material I spoke about has been covered in the last month in my newspaper column, including, amazingly, today. Look at that, right off the presses. <laughs> I use it as an advertisement for the presentation. But as you see, since July, there was one on robots, artificial evolution, teleportation, and man-machine interfaces. So if you want to read more, you can go online. You can find all those different articles. And I'm going to wrap up with one last short video. So we saw Fringe 1985, right? You remember some of the things that was shown? Personal computing, invisibility, stealth technology, all the things that they hoped would become real. In this particular storyline, 2036 is not a happy time. Those observers we, we saw 
have come back in time to 2015. My God, that's next year. And they have basically have enslaved us for their future needs. And in 2036, there's like a group of rebels. And they dream of new developments to improve their life. Remember, for them, these are things that are not real, but they would like to be real. All right, and with that, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.